free clinic. Like if you really like Patch Adams style, he basically worked outside jobs so he could fund, um, he could uh, basically, it was like $250 each, they contributed to run this six bedroom house free clinic. And uh, yeah, I mean, you could, like Patch Adams, he never charged anyone a dollar in his life. He just worked outside jobs for the joy of giving healthcare away for free. For free, that's totally available to you too, if that feels good. Then there's like this other model, which I think is super cool that not enough people have done, that you could be so newsworthy and get free publicity from this, like your whole life. Do a dual business model where you go and do two different businesses at once or somehow work with another business, like say you're, you want to attract an intellectual crowd, you know, like open your clinic in Powell. So wouldn't that be cool? Your whole waiting room could be like a bookstore. You know what I mean? And you could get like, oh my God, it would be great. Or like you could work in a gym or like this real story of a lawyer in LA who opened a hot dog stand. And every time his hot dog stand opened, he had like a line that went around like three whole city blocks because he gave free, um, free law advice with every hot dog. You know what I mean? <laughs> to like figure out like, and there's a guy in Chicago where the malpractice rates are so high that he decided he was maybe going to open a coffee shop and just do free physicals in the back room. You know what I mean? But make all the money from all the co coffee. Like, there's super cool ways. And there's like a woman, Chrissy Ott, in town, and she uh, basically uses the local coffee shop as her waiting room if she waits, if she runs late, kind of like my soap basket thing. People know that, you know on rare occasions when she's late, they can just go to this Java stop place or whatever next to her and get a free cup of coffee because she's worked it out with the owner of that place. They're gonna kind of support each other, you know. And so, wouldn't that be cool? So, um, cures for common office irritants. Basically, I totally, I don't know if you do, well, you do prescribe herbs, but I do not do any refills between appointments, just a pain in the butt. Because like 30% of all my phone calls and all phone calls to an average office or about refills. So it's like, figure out with your patient how much they can handle. You know, like your diabetes is in good control, so I'm going to give you a three month supply or a six month supply or you've been on the same thyroid dose for like two years, so I'm going to give you a year supply. If you only give a month supply, they're going to call and be begging like that annoying child that wants that cereal that you don't want to give them. You know what I mean? Or the toy. Like you're going to feel like people are nagging you a lot for things but it's your own fault because we create our own dependent monsters as, as patients, it, depending on how functional we are and how uh, willing we are to be adults. See, in allopathic medicine, we're told to treat everyone like a fourth grader, talk at a fourth grade level, people are stupid, they don't understand anything. And so if you do that, you're dumbing your patients down, possibly, and then you're creating them as dependents and they, you feel like kind of an adversarial relationship with them. You know what I mean? So I really recommend that you be a functional adult and treat your patients as if they could be really highly functioning adults and then raise the bar on the behavior and they'll meet you there. Like, it's kind of like puppy training, you know? Like, if you want a really good puppy, like, be consistent and you know what you have to do to have a good child. I didn't really do the biological parenting thing, but like, you know, you have to be consistent and, and it, it pays off. You get like respect and a, a mutual uh, relationship that works. And um, I have a no-show and cancellation fee, which I think everyone should have because otherwise people will devalue your service because if they can just not show up over and over again and there's no penalty, like, you know, you're gonna be sitting there twiddling your thumbs. So I charge like $50 for no-shows and cancellations. Yes? I have a question about all of your models. Uh-huh. You know, um, we have a lot of acupuncture so we're trying to get information about how to do that. Mm -hmm. then you have to have one uh, fee sheet. You can't have two separate fee schedules. You can't have, I'm gonna charge uninsured people like this and I'm gonna charge insurance companies like this because that's like insurance fraud. You have to have one fee schedule and then you can maybe get like 30% off, which is what I give for payment at time of service. So, um, but there's a lot of information on whether you should take insurance, should you, shouldn't you, like whether it makes sense, which I'm gonna start a teleclass, which we're, and I also have some of that maybe in the FAQ you can get for me, but a lot of this is like actually illegal to talk about because you can't really sit with another doctor and say, hey, what do you charge for a 99214? 
if you have that conversation, that also is considered insurance fraud because those two doctors could take down the whole insurance industry, right? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. But that's, you know, they, they basically intimidate people into paralysis, you know? So that's why we're like, uh, you know, and we're not even alive anymore because we've just given it all away. And I just think we need to like step up, stand up. You know, if you want to figure out how something's done, go find someone else in your field who's already in solo practice in town. Take them out to lunch and pick their brain. You know what I mean? Like, people are more than happy to help one another open clinics. It's just that most people just sit by themselves and go, oh, how will I do it? You know what I mean? And um, ask around, you know? And have lots of mentors. And, um, and let's see. So phone calls, by the way, to answer your question, I'm still on the what do I do to get rid of the, all the staff. But like emergency phone calls come on my cell phone and non-urgent phone calls go to my landline. So it's great, like 99% of my phone calls are just waiting for me on my landline, which I have at home because it's just more convenient for me to answer questions before and after dinner and when I feel like it and after I do the laundry. Like I don't want, and I don't do cyberspace, so I don't do phone medicine, I don't do you know, internet medicine. People come for appointments and they're mostly calling for appointments or calling to clarify something they didn't understand, which is mostly happening through the computer. Anyway, like I really don't use the phone that much. Like almost everything is like simple questions, like just when was my appointment again, or what was the vitamin D you told me to take, you know. But I rarely get disturbed at all with anything because I because now during appointments I'm setting up emails to the patients where I summarize like the top three things we discussed. So by the time they get home, they have an email from me that says, "Call this energy worker, try Reiki, try to take vitamin D at this dose," you know, like the four little sentences they need to know. They don't really need like their whole chart note. They just need like, what were the four things you told me that I need to do? And I write those down in really short sentences with links and phone numbers to the people that I want them to call and I just send it to them. By the time their visit is over, they have it, right? And okay, for marketing purposes, like do not ever, ever, ever spend any money on advertising. It's all word of mouth. Like, you make one person happy, and they will tell everyone in the whole town. Like, one day, I got, like, five people calling from the same employer for appointments. I was like, well, why are you all calling? And they're like, well, so-and-so went to the cafeteria and stood on a chair and said, oh, my God, you have to call Dr. Marvel. She's amazing. You know, I basically read out my phone number to everyone, and then, like, five people called me, and that's, you know. So, like, one happy patient can fill your entire schedule. So since you start your practice kind of slow, like most people aren't full on the first day, you could just totally VIP people out for the first month or two. You know what I mean? Until you get your case up. And those people will be like, I found the most amazing doctor. They'll leave and call their relatives out of state, explain what happened. You know what I mean? And then, you know, they'll tell all their friends, you don't really need to have like in Eugene, I always see doctors on the side of buses and I'm like, that is dumb. <laughs> and, and like that's like not really people don't pick their doctors based on pictures on a bus you know what I mean people pick their doctors who are putting fingers and stuff inside of you on like what their friends said you know what I mean you're not going to just go to a guy in college who saw his picture on a bus you're going to ask your friend who's a good guy to call this to your sister because you have a problem you're not going to pick someone you saw on a bus you know? Anyway, it's just common sense. And then if you want advertising, like, you know, call the newspaper up and tell them you're giving soap to your patients or you're doing a free something or you started a hot dog stand and where you're getting, you know, like you're doing acupuncture and hot dogs or think of some combination that's funny and actually think of a rhyme, you know what I mean? If you can make it rhyme, hot dogs and herbs or whatever, or herbal hot dog, I don't know, think of something really interesting and then call the newspaper and say, free, uh, on this corner we're doing a, what do you call it, a mob something with hot dogs and herbs and, you know what I mean? Like, just get excited and bring balloons and bring this guy, you know what I mean? And stand on a corner. And like the newspaper, will have to make it visual for the news, you know what I mean? Balloons skeleton, make it interesting looking, right? If you're only doing things with small needles that they can't see, it's not as much of a photo video shoot, right? But if you have something laying in the middle of some intersection here, they close down for a party, acupuncture needles, 
needles in them. Like that could be a really interesting photo shoot. And so you'll get a whole article like written about you, like on a whole page of the Oregonian, which is so much better than like you promoting yourself and paying for advertising. And uh, finally, I'll say media begets media. So the more media you get, you just keep recycling it. You're like, okay, then you take that story and you send it somewhere else, and pretty soon you're in the Boomer and the Seniors News and the Church Newsletter and the Oregonian, and you know what I mean? It just keeps going like that. Okay, quickly I'm gonna answer some questions that were sent to me by your group on Facebook. Okay, this was, who's Andy Vile? Yes, Andy wrote, I personally tend to get a lot of very seriously ill, even terminal patients. Any ideas about how to cope with the psychological, emotional toll on us as practitioners would be great. I have a little support group of other practitioners that talk to each other to help process the emotions surrounding this, but any other ideas would be great. Okay, death is not failure. Illness is not failure. You've got to get into the spiritual zone. Once you connect with someone spiritually, like, some people want to die young. Like, that, that wasn't their life plan to be, like, winning the longevity contest. They want to do certain things. They need to pass on to do something else. I don't know if you believe in reincarnation, but it really helps if you have like a bigger perspective of life than just what you're doing right now. And so just reframe their illness as an amazing spiritual journey. Every time I give somebody good news, I always like switch it around like, wow, this is going to be a great opportunity for you to break free of this habit and do this and go on a journal. And you know, like I try to, and they leave often smiling, even though I just totally have breast cancer and they, like you gotta like give them like ground them in something other than oh physical bad news like physical bad news is just kind of inevitable you know what i mean so and then uh, i would recommend that you read the death section of my book because like basically the book has eight different sections and they're all the things we didn't learn in medical school that you need to have a, you need to know to be a good doctor like joy creativity and love how to handle death it's amazing they don't take that notes when they don't and um you know just intuition. Anyway, so in the death section, which is my favorite section of the book, you could see, like, you could be playful about death. You, it's, It doesn't have to be a downer, you know? It's actually, like, my favorite thing to do with patients, to die with them. No, my favorite <laughs> thing to do is to be there as they transition, because it's really beautiful. And I so much prefer that than birth, actually. Because babies don't really tell you anything. It's not crying, but, like, there's words of wisdom that people say at the very end, and you want to be there to listen to that last sentence. And then I believe professional closeness will help because like the whole idea of I'm gonna be stoic and I'm gonna stand over here and you stay on your side of the room, like that doesn't really help with feeling like um, we're in it together, you know? And I think kind of just being in it together and feeling um, like the excitement of the unknown together is kind of cool. Um, Weekly therapy, I think anyone in healthcare who sees trauma or experiences death or loss, whatever, we should just be going to a therapist every week, which I think should just be part of our training program. But if you have to pay for it yourself and go every week to a therapist, that's like what I've been doing for five years, going to see a therapist every week because this cool medical intuitive and it's great and it just helps me with a lot of different things that I'm trying to understand, like about physician suicide and other topics that are not that easy to understand because I can't interview them because they're dead understand things that are otherworldly, right? And then having a going and getting a massage once a week, you know, to release this, having some sort of release at the end of the day, like a shower or swimming or something where you like get it out of your system and a balance group, which is what you should write that down, it's really cool. B-A-L-I-N-T, like a lot of doctors um, had these during training, I did, where we all got together, like four or five of us, and discussed cases and how they made us feel. So it wasn't really like a case report to discover something new about a disease. It was more like, when I'm with a patient with this, here's how it makes me feel. You know, and so people hear each other's feelings and you get to process how you feel. And reading about that and maybe structuring a balance group would be cool because we need each other to heal. Um, how do you maintain boundaries? What do you consider the most important boundaries to maintain? Well, you have to know your own boundaries and then make them clear to the patient because patients want to be good puppies. You know what I mean? But you have to like say what the rules are. But often we don't do that. And then we get frustrated because they broke rules that we never explained or we're not consistent with. And so it's really important to like not accept abuse. Once you start accepting abusive contracts, abusive employers, abusive patients, it's just gonna go downhill from there. Nothing gets better. Like you're basically saying shit on me. You know what I mean? And so you might have to fire people. 
You might say this is no longer a therapeutic relationship. If you're sitting up at night like thinking about a patient over and over again and it's really getting on your nerves, you might want to fire them. It's not working out because you're spending so much of your personal time assessing on something that you that maybe they need a different type of doctor. It's too much of a struggle. Okay. And then um, how do you handle insurance billing as a solo doc? I use Office Ally, but there's lots of free online clearing houses and it's free and it's easy and I do it right after the appointment. And do I offer sliding scale? No, because you can't do that legally and have insurance contracts. Like I can offer discounts for payment at time of service and take insurance or not take insurance at all and do whatever I want, charge $10 per minute or you know, whatever you decide you could do. And then do you, do you do pro bono work? No, I don't believe in giving anything away for free. I believe if I'm gonna do something, they need to pay it forward. Like, okay, you're gonna see me, this rarely happens, but if someone's gonna see me and they don't have the money, then they need to donate to the gift basket. So somebody else can have their handmade cards or lotions or potions, right? Or like they need to volunteer at the soup kitchen. You know what I mean? They need to do something. This isn't like passively help me, help me. I'm not gonna do anything for anyone else. Like that's not healthcare. So don't ever do. I, I really don't recommend giving yourself away for free. Okay, then any real world practical thoughts you may have about practice management and care for your patients will be awesome. Okay, do what you love and people will love you. Have fun and patients will have fun. Never pay for advertising. Do today's work today. Like don't leave your office with a pile of stuff you haven't finished. Okay, mistakes or pitfalls when establishing a practice. I interviewed like tons of doctors on this. It's on my workbook that I have for my retreat, but I'm just reading the top ones that I got from lots of doctors who've opened solo practices. Not adhering to your original vision and community vision. Number two, not making your mission clear to the patients, because you have no idea what your mission is, so they don't even know if they're in the right place. Um, don't rent too much space, it's really expensive. It's much harder to get out of a big lease than add more space later, you know? Or it's much harder to fire people you don't need once you hire them than to add people later. I totally recommend that you do everything yourself at the beginning and see if you like it. And when you get busy enough, if there's something that you don't like, then hire somebody who you trust to do that little piece that you don't like. Then if they quit out of the blue or go off on maternity leave, you still know how to do it and you can run your office. You're not like clueless. You do not want to delegate the business of medicine and make it a mystery. You want to understand all this. And high overhead is a big mistake. Hiring experts, practice consultants, and gurus is a mistake. Okay, a big one is having ignorance, fear, and self-doubt. You know, because honestly, you can do this with electricians and plumbers are self-employed. And all they do is wander around town with a van and tubes and wires looking for broken toilets. It's like as easy as that. But somehow, like if you can understand the Krebs cycle, you can totally understand how to run a practice, it's just addition. But people are like, oh my God, that's too hard. But it's like, oh my God, like all the stuff you have to learn to get into medical school or pass the MCAT and like, this is so easy. But people just give it all away. And it's like, okay, electricians and plumbers are making more than primary care doctors because they're courageous enough to put tubes in their truck and drive around town looking for bad sewer lines. And you're scared and full of ignorance and self-doubt, you know? It's like sad that people get in this weird situation. So like believe in yourself, okay? Okay, listening to naysayers and negative feedback from doctor friends who are like, oh, that'll never work, that can never happen. Okay, look, just because you can make your dreams come true, don't inflict your bad attitude on me and don't take the dreams of the next generation. Like the next generation of doctors is really creative and might just have more falls than you, might be able to do it, you know what I mean? So why hold them back? So I don't know, I, I just think we have a lot of mentors who are like really negative and cynical and it's like they're not helping. And then hiring staff, buying expensive technology and not having mentors, okay? Okay, how best to approach MDs for integrating acupuncture or herbal therapies on the patients? Like I understand a lot of MDs are on the verge of suicide. So probably would be the best thing is just go, hey, do you wanna come for a free treatment after work? Because I really wanna show you what I do, because I just graduated from school and I have all the energy in the world and I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed and you're not. And I think I can help you. You know, maybe they'll sign up and you'll be their weekly thing that they do, but then they'll have real world experience on what you offer and they can tell your patients, oh, you gotta go see Jennifer. I go to her, she does acupuncture on me every Friday. You know what I mean? And so they need to know what you do and they need to experience what you do to know what you do so they can explain it because we didn't get trained in it. So I would really recommend that you go find the most miserable doctors in town and try to help them. 
because they need help. I mean, who else is going to help them? I mean, we have to help each other heal. If we're really healers, we should be helping each other. And so then you have like like referrals for the rest of your life from somebody who like would literally eventually tell you you saved my life. And wouldn't that be cool? Instead of having an adversarial relation. Oh, and also, you know, doctors are so busy and they can't handle like there's certain cases they don't like. Like complex cases in 12 minutes is a real irritant. Say you really like complicated cases. Go over to a doctor's office and say, you know what? I really love fibromyalgia and I love patients with high need psych issues. They'd be like, oh my God, you're like an angel <laughs> coming through the door. You know, like, like you literally save their practice and their, um, they, it's just great. Go offer something that they need personally or that they need help with in regard to their patients. And um, let's see, from your perspective, what is the best way for Chinese medical practitioners to interface, another similar question, interface with MDs regarding patient care? Okay, like work in the same office or close by in a wellness center. And like do that thing where you're doing the same, where you're integrating the treatments in one office visit. Like if you have somebody that's really creative and wants to think out of the box, like do acupuncture and psychiatry visits together. Or you know, see what would go well at the same time. And um, and uh, your top three best practice tips, love people, have fun, work part-time. What was the tipping point for her to change paradigms, misery, suicidal thoughts? I was started to dream of waitressing. I started to think if I could just get back to Chi Chi's where I used to be a waitress <laughs> and just do Mexican food again, I'd be happy. You know, and it's like, that doesn't really make sense because I really like being a doctor, but not here. You know what I mean? So, like, I really didn't need to go back to my Mexican food waitressing job. Um, I just need to have my own clinic, you know. What would you tell a new practitioner regarding patient care and practice management? Solo practice is easy. Plumbers and electricians do it, and all you need to know is simpler than even understanding the Krebs cycle. So that's it. And I'll take questions. More questions. I just want to answer the questions I already got. So there's no question. Yep. Yeah. Well, the insurance billing, um, how do I fit in insurance billing? It only takes like one to two minutes after each patient. It's super easy. Most of these online clearinghouses sort of, I mean, the first visit you have to enter name, address, phone number, whatever, it takes an extra minute or two, but then it's all stored in their system. All you do is go back in there and pull up the name of the patient and just change the date, and you probably have memorized like the most relevant diagnosis codes, like 789.00 abdominal pain, and, 729.5, like pain in a limb, and you just you just put that down and press update, and then like you'll get paid two weeks later by the insurance company, which this is a really high reimbursement zone. So this is an actual great place to take insurance if you want to make good money. If you work in the middle of Ohio, you could do the same thing and get paid a third as much. And I have no idea why the well the people are not very happy there with their doctors, and the doctors are not very happy because they're all getting paid so much less for the same amount of work. You know, if you want to get paid a lot, move to Alaska. They have the highest reimbursement in the country. You could totally break it in on insurance. But like these are all things that you would just know from asking around and meeting other acupuncturists from Alaska. And, you know, maybe you have you should start an online group of people who are in acupuncture or alumni here who can compare notes. This one lives in Mississippi and doesn't recommend it. This one says acupuncture is great in Alaska. And, and they really like herbal medicine in Wisconsin. And you know what I mean? Like, I think you should create your own network of supportive people who you can ask questions to in the middle of the night. More questions about anything at all? Yes. about healthcare, I wanted to have the whole Rubik's Cube in my hand. And I'm like, wow, this is interesting. And this is what they're saying on the phone, and that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, otherwise, like, everything's in cubicles. And as a business owner, you really need to understand what's happening in all the cubicles. And as somebody who wants to speak intelligently about healthcare and healthcare policy and the direction of healthcare in the country, you should understand who's doing what in what cubicle. 
and you might have something intelligent to say that would help other people avoid misery-provoking models and systems. Yes? Um, since you kind of handle all your insurance stuff, you're probably more aware of how much things are for different patients. Do you find yourself that you're going to make decisions based on that type for patients? No, but I do know that if you put mental health diagnoses first, that your claims can get denied. So even though somebody comes in with depression, I always ask, well, how does that feel for you there? Are you getting a headache? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I always put headache, stomach pain, everything else first, and depression at the end, because if you put depression first, it wouldn't cover the bill, you know? And then the patient would have to pay. So, like TMJ, they don't cover TMJ, like, TMJ, like dental and mental, not covered. So uh, insurance, just they think we're bodies without heads and, you know, and teeth, <laughs> and that's, all they want to deal with is just sometimes they'll pay for body illness. <laughs> yes? In my community, I find like everybody asks a lot of the same questions. I thought, you know, maybe I'll just do overall community education so it's not having the same conversation 50 times, you know, a week. Do you do any sort of overall education or classes to kind of help? That she has to repeat the same, like I have to repeat the same sinus, sinusitis discussion over and over and over again. And I don't do group sinusitis classes yet, but you could, like, if that made sense for you and people were willing to, especially people who need support making lifestyle changes like diabetes or high blood pressure, like if you had the energy, like obviously my energy is going into healing the whole healthcare system and not doing lots of fun groups with my patients. I'm trying to do groups with doctors and get them to take the paper chains off, but um, like people are totally receptive to groups, so you have to see who would want to do it. And if you could build for it, which I think you can do, you know, group classes and insurance. So. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you have learned doing the love model that if you had known that during the show model would have changed your experience during those 10 years? Yeah, like I just think, why was I so weak? Like that I didn't get this sooner. Like I don't know why I had to, I don't really understand why people have to suffer so much before they get it. You know what I mean? Like I'm somebody who, apparently needs to suffer more than the average amount so that I could feel the pain of what I've caused myself so that I can somehow break out of the shell and go, aha, you know what I mean? Like, it would be so cool. Like, that's why I'm here. Like, I don't really want everyone to suffer as much as I did because I think, to me, it just seems unnecessary. But maybe it was a personal growth experience that I needed, I don't know. So, yeah, I, I think... Yeah, I just wouldn't take it uh, for as long. <laughs> the abuse, yeah. My, my pediatrician should be hot. Uh -huh. I'm always amazed that there aren't more physicians moving to that model. She does that every year as far as the way that people are talking about it. So I'm curious if we're having a conversation with people like so many people interested. Is there an online community or sort of place where people are discussing this? I think doctors are discussing this in little pockets all over the place, but. Um, like a lot of those discussions are physician centric, which I think ultimately aren't just, like they're not really making their case to the patients. You know, really I think this is gonna be led by patient demand because doctors are like zoned out and you can't, no matter how many times you give them a free pet goats and pap smears and you say you can do it rah, 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 they're just like, like they need so much therapy to recuperate from the trauma that they've seen that's why I did this retreat at Breckenbush for like three and a half days, which was like giving eight years of practice management that I learned, plus like exorcisms on like 20 people that <laughs> needed to like get PTSD out of their body, which is why when I got home I'd take a nap for two days because it's exhausting. You know what I mean? But I think uh, it, this has to be led by patients. Like patients have to demand it. Patients have to boycott clinics that are disrespectful and go to see doctors that respect them and they're actually providing healing, you know what I mean? And then, like, the more people that get brave enough to move to that model, the, the faster it'll happen. It's just, this is ultimately going to happen, it's just a matter of velocity. How fast do we want everyone to have ideal medical care in this country? Or do we just want to, like, piddle along the way we are and just be miserable and 
have more doctors die every day and shoot themselves in the parks and go out to like, I mean, how, how much uh, our trauma are we willing to take as a culture? And when, like, how much misery do you need in your body before you're willing to stand up for yourself and everyone around you? Like, that's what it is. It's like a, a ripple effect. Which, this is kind of a weird aside, but I do, like, I never had kids, and I, when I'm talking to medical students, sometimes I feel like I'm breastfeeding. I feel like this is a very, like, maternal <laughs> thing for me. Like, I really want to help all these baby birds, like, jump out of the nest and, like, freely fly through the sky and do their own thing. At my retreat, I said, it's like the nipple effect. The ripple effect. It's like, all you have to do is just be loving and love your life and get out there. And it's like, people see that you're happy. Like, they want to be happy too. So they want to see, what are you doing? That's right. And how can they suckle a little bit and learn from you? And, you know, it's like, really, we need more heart and soul. And we need more people willing to, like, open their heart and soul and be free so that we can show other people the way. Like we're, we're, we are a beacon of light, like every one of us. So uh, I just don't know why we have to be so miserable before we, why do you guys think we have to reach such a level of misery before we do anything? It seems so counterproductive. But anyway, more questions? Yes? No, I don't do appointment reminders and follow-up calls because they get their appointment the same day. You know what I mean? So it's like there's no time to remind them because they just called and now they're here. <laughs> you know what I mean? It really works like if you don't have a backlog and you create a situation where you have the perfect panel of patients so that you can see everyone the same day or next day because that's when people really need you. And by the time, like 80% of people's ailments go away on their own within two to four weeks or something if you make them wait. Their pain went away, and then they'll forget their appointment. And really, what's happening during their appointment, like Patch Adams always says, well, I tricked them to come in with their knee pain, but really, we're doing a lot of other stuff and helping them get rid of loneliness and despair and work on their marriage. And you know, so there's a lot of healing that happens, which we can't even put words to. You know, we can't. Like people are just uh, out of balance and, and not connecting. And so, like sometimes sitting with you uninterrupted for 30 to 60 minutes could be the only time anyone's really listening to them all week where they feel heard and the value of that like you can't even put into words and, and by the way like you should not feel like you're imposing on people when you ask their opinion some shy people and people who are maybe nervous to go up to somebody in a laundromat or on the bus stop and say what would an ideal visit be like I just have to say like before I use this cover of my book I went around <clears throat> and I went through airports and asked people, wow, if you saw a book like this, would you get it? Or what do you think this is about? You know, and I just did like a survey, not that I was going to change the book at all. I just wanted to know like where people ranked it on a one to 10. And anyway, like I was at Market of Choice in Eugene, like near closing time. And I asked this woman and she started crying after she told me the answers. And I'm like, why are you crying? She said, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. She's like 22, and I was like, what? She said that somebody came and asked me my opinion about a book cover. And I was like, really? <laughs> she said, I said, like, like in your whole life? She said, in my whole life, that somebody cares enough to ask me my opinion on, on a book cover. People are like starving for human contact and to ask them their opinion on anything. This guy that I asked at like a parking meter at downtown Eugene, I was like, what do you think of this? And we had a long conversation and now a Facebook friend and everything. And he's like, he, and I have it on audio, he's like, you know, more people should walk around town and asking people what they think about things, you know, even if they're not running for political office, you know, just because they give a shit. <laughs> you know, that's how hungry people are for you to ask them what they want about almost anything, any topic. Like, people are lonely and disconnected, and they need to have conversations with other people that are real about something that's uplifting. So, go get your tape recorder. Any other questions? Do you have a favorite breed of goats? Breed of goats? Uh, I don't know. It's not my goat. It's my patient's goat. Yeah, and I, I don't even, I forgot what breed it is, but it's really cool because her name is Charity, and all the proceeds to the book go to Charity, meaning, 
helping doctors break free and open their own clinics. So it was just kind of, it was kind of weird how I ended up with this goat in there. It's a long story, but yeah. More questions? Did you have a question? No, I just, I just think that everybody here is lucky to have you come and just tell the truth like you did. Okay, well, pass it forward, spread the news, uh, proselytize this, <laughs> go door to door. That's another thing that's really cool, like if you don't want to take aboard people at bus stops and say you're going to open your clinic in a certain neighborhood, go door to door with a little red wagon and your three-year-old and say, hi, <laughs> you know, don't be Jehovah's Witness, be the other kind, just say, hi, I'm here with an organic apple and I'm opening a clinic right around the corner and I just want to know, do you prefer office hours late in the evening or early in the morning? Or, like ask them something substantial where you're getting their opinion um, about your clinic, right? There was a really cool story that Jack Canfield told once about a chiropractor who wanted to open a, a clinic and told the Chiropractic Association in some town like Santa Rosa, California, you know, that he's going to open a clinic and the Chiropractic Association said, no, don't open one here, we have too many chiropractors. Well, he wasn't the church because he really wanted to open this practice there. So he basically went door to door at 6,000 houses and he basically asked them, you know, he said, I'm so-and-so, you know, and do you think I should name my clinic Northwest Chiropractic or Piazza Chiropractic was like his last name and do you, would you prefer morning hours or evening hours? And he wrote down their responses. He said, well, when I open my clinic, do you want to come to the opening party, you know? And they said, yeah, and he'd give them a card and write down a phone number, you know? And then the day he opened his clinic, he had like, I don't know, 6,000 people show up and had to rent a circus tent, <laughs> even though like there were too many chiropractors in town, you know? And then in his first month, he brought in like $75,000 profit. And this was all just from like going door to door and saying hi to people, which people are starving for real conversations. So like, wouldn't that be cool for people to know that you're two blocks away and they could walk to your office and you met them by going door to door and explaining what you do. And yeah, so. Any other questions? Okay, yes? So your ideal medical clinic, uh, you have a website with, that's connected to that or a group of yeah, people? Yeah, well I have idealmedicalcare.org and you should contact me. And everyone should Facebook friend me because I put lots of articles up and things that will inspire you. And I have a professional photographer I work with who goes on house calls with me and we put up the pictures and patients tell their true stories about what it was like to have certain types of medical visits, and I think you could like learn a lot from just seeing some of the stuff that I do in print or video or however you like to learn. But just stay in touch, and then I can always send you the FAQ and um, and other resources because there are doctors, little pockets of doctors around the country doing similar things, and they could kind of lead you wherever would be helpful. Yes. Before we close out, can you share more about the book? Okay, the book is like um, $10 today, and I brought, I don't know, like 70 copies or something, so, or 50 copies, so if anyone wants, I only do cash. And, and that's another thing at my clinic, I don't accept credit cards, because I don't want to pay 3%, I don't want to sit and keep doing this with a credit card thing. I don't know, I know you can, but it's like banks and extra fees, and it's just easier when people bring cash. Cash is always good, for so many reasons. And then also checks, Great, you know? I only had like two checks bounce in like nine years. And they were so sorry, and I had a $30 fee for a bounce check, so I made more money. You know? Because the bank only charges 10. But it's my time to have to deal with a bounce check. Anyway, so the point is, yeah, um, the book you can get on Amazon. You can get it as an ebook on Amazon. For a while, it was like the number one top rated medical ebook on Amazon for like months at a time. And, um, I just love this book. So obviously, like I kiss every single one before they leave my house. What? I kiss the ebook too. I kiss the ebook. I, you know, I try. <laughs> so anyway, I'll be here, and you can come and get any books that you want, and maybe somebody will take a picture of us and stuff. <laughs>